I'd now like to ask Mr. Falconer to give us his talk. But before we begin, a little bit about Mr. Falconer. I know we're all familiar with him, but it is my duty. John Falconer joined the British Library in 1993 in order to produce the first detailed online catalogue of its collections of historical photographs from India and other parts of Asia. He has a particular interest in the links between photography and archaeology, both in Asia and elsewhere, and has published widely in this field. He has also curated a number of exhibitions of historical photographs, both in the UK and internationally. Until his retirement in 2016, he was lead curator of visual arts at the British Library and has very kindly continued his association and made this exhibition happen. Uh, Mr. John Falcon, over to you. Um, there couldn't be a more inappropriate time to have a nosebleed, so I'm afraid you'll have to forgive me if I keep dabbing at myself with a rather grubby handkerchief. Um, but be that as it may. Um, it really is wonderful to be back in Mumbai and to meet old friends and to make some new ones. Um, Roly Keating and Mr Mukherjee have stressed the mutual benefits of the collaborative nature of this exhibition and its predecessors indeed at an institutional level. Mr Mukherjee's friendship and support for this project have of course been critical. Um, and I must add my own thanks to the British Council for their support of the exhibition, which indeed has made my own visit possible. Um, and I'm happy to affirm the, su the success of this initiative at the practical level of putting this collaboration to practical effect in the mounting of the present exhibition. It's been a great personal privilege to work with the staff of CSMVS on bringing to fruition a project which has been the subject of discussion between the British Council and CSMVS over a number of years. Um, and for myself, it represents a practical outcome one of many in the future perhaps as well, of a long-standing personal interest in the visual representation of Indian archi architecture and archaeology. Using original material from the British Library's collection, CSMVS has produced what is, I'm sure you'll agree when you see the results, a stunning and elegant tribute to those 19th century photographers who over the course of half a century attempted to document the immense richness of India's material culture. And the venue of this exhibition is particularly appropriate since it was from Bombay that many of these first initiatives originated. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But first of all, I, at the risk of repeating, I do still need to mention some of those involved in the present exhibition since my gratitude is personal and I do need to express it also. The enthusiasm and commitment of all the staff at CSMVS has been hugely impressive and I've been moved by the friendliness of the welcome I've received in the museum. The names of those involved in putting on the present display can be found on the acknowledgement panel in the exhibition. But this evening, I do have to single out Vadei Satval and Nikhil Ramesh, who worked with this project from the beginning and have seen it through to its, this opening event. It's impossible to overstress their dedication to the exhibition. Uh, that began in, with an outline display for 40 or so prints, but by its completion has now doubled in size, not counting the modern comparison prints shown in the exhibition. I'm sure that if Nikhil had his way, the exhibition would have been larger still, uh, and that's an enthusiasm I share. Um, but on this visit, it has been wonderful to meet Vade and Nikhil in person at last, after Zoom meetings through which the, the exhibition has been organised and implemented. And the mention of these prints brings me to perhaps the most ambitious aspect of the exhibition. It was my original understanding, when the exhibition was first proposed, that we would make digital facsimiles from original paper and glass negatives held in the British Library. When Nikhil informed me that he, he proposed making sorted paper and album and prints using original 19th century processes for the whole exhibition, I confess I was apprehensive about the practicality of this. That I've been proved so wrong in this is due to the work of Arpan Mukherjee and his team, whose skills have produced a magnificent series of images which bring these photographs to life in a way that they might have been appreciated by a 19th century or, or 
audience. I was going to describe the process a little bit more, but actually, Roly, you described it so well, I'm not going to repeat that. I thought it's an excellent summary of, of uh, how, the, how the material has been produced. And, and I do believe it's a, a truly remarkable and groundbreaking achievement particularly in view of the time scale for production and the fact that Arpan did not have access to original prints for comparison in order to produce this work. Many of my colleagues at the British Library must also be acknowledged for making this exhibition possible, either in an administrative or curatorial capacity. As well as Rayleigh Keating, two of them are here today, or three of them are here today, Louisa Mengoni, who heads the Asian and Arts Department at the British Library, and Malini Roy, who took time for her own busy schedule to work on this project. And of course, Marcy Hopkins from our international team has been involved in the exhibition from the start. Although she's not here in Mumbai, I also have to thank Geraldine Kenny from the Library's Exhibition Department, who is largely responsible for coordinating the exhibition from the UK end and also for remorselessly pursuing me for overdue texts and berating me about writing over long sentences, which have been ruthlessly cut down. Um, anyway, thank you, Geraldine. Um, so a little more about the exhibition, which I don't want to detain you too long from seeing. Um, as, a, as a background to the material on display, um, it's appropriate to preface this account of these early photographs with some remarks made by the scholar James Burgess, who will be familiar to many of you, who spent most of his Indian career in Bombay and who in 1874 was appointed the first archaeological surveyor of Western India. And of course, he later succeeded Alexander Cunningham, of director general of the archaeological survey. At the 8th International Congress of Orientalists, which was held in Stockholm in 1883, Burgess gave a paper entitled Archaeological Researches in India, in which he looked back on the preceding half century, a half century in which archaeology had developed from an antiquarian hobby into a professional discipline. Archaeology, he considered, and that is in the study of architecture, sculpture and epigraphy, was the key to revealing India's past history and, as he put it, the collection of sufficient and accurate materials for such a study is surely a manifest duty of an enlightened government. Burgess praised those early artists from the 18th and early 19th century, such as James Wales and of course the Daniels. And let's have a picture here of some of this sort of work that I'm sure you're familiar with, um, who had stimulated Orient European interest in Indian architecture and scenery as well as a number of those amateur artists and antiquarians, figures such as the army officer Charles Maisie, who had directed their talents to archaeological subjects. Maisie did a major documentation of Sanchi and other sites as a um, secondment from government duty. But he considered these um, artistic works merely a preliminary to the scientific study of architecture. Uh, and, and this is a stress that constantly recurs in his account. The great exponent of this scientific approach for Burgess was James Ferguson, again a name I'm sure is very familiar to you, who brought a new intellectual and analytical rigour to the subject, in contrast to the Director General of the ASI, Alexander Cunningham, who Burgess clearly felt, um, clearly considered an unmethodical and old-fashioned in his approach. And um, there's quite a lot of sort of personal enmities between some of these early archaeologists. Um, for Burgess, and equally importantly Ferguson, photography had a key role to play in producing and disseminating accurate documentation of the history of Indian architecture. And in fact, Ferguson, more than any other single figure, and over a long period, was central in persuading the Indian authorities of the importance of the medium. And, it's his, and it is the development of photography in, the context, in this context in Western India in the last half of the 19th century that's examined in the present exhibition. I think actually I have a portrait of Ferguson here. Yes, that's the man himself. Um, various strategies to produce this documentary record in the period were undertaken in the period under examination. And the ex exhibition examines six groups of photographs and photographers whose work charts the development of its use from the first experimental projects in the mid-1850s up to the end of the century, by which time the medium had been fully absorbed in the day-to-day -day 
working practice of archaeologists. Um, and the first figure we come to in this, um, well, if we just look briefly, look at Ferguson, who's emphasis on the accuracy of records of architecture is actually illustrated in his own work which while not photographic was drawn with the camera lucida and he boasts that it was entirely accurate and any pictorial figures such as the figures in the foreground are the only embellishments to um, an accurate document um, but Ferguson at this time did not have access to photography this comes with a man called Thomas Biggs, who in the mid early 1850s took up photography himself, as he said, for its use in copying inscriptions in India. Um, in the first instance, his emphasis was not on documenting architecture or archaeology, but in recording inscriptions which previously had to be painstakingly copied and, and recorded. Um, his idea for doing this, it's quite interesting to see the technique that was proposed at this time, which would fall foul of any conservator these days. This is the Cave 3 in, at Badami, and the process for making inscriptions, preparing inscriptions for photography was first of all to whitewash the stone, then to cover the flat surface with Indian ink, leaving the whitewash in the relief areas prominent so it could then be photographed. Uh, and so you can see the whitewash dripping down the stone in this particular image. Um, it creates a rather surreal effect. Um, just as a side note, um, it was almost completely ineffective as a tool for scholars. Um, and of the thousands of photographs of inscriptions that were made in the 19th century, very few were actually used for scholarly purposes. Um, but um, Biggs persuaded the India office that um, photography was a tool for the documentation of architecture as well. And in 1855, the government of uh, Bombay was instructed to stop using art artists to copy caves at huge expense and very slowly and to take up photography which was considered to be a cheap and um, economical and quick tool. Um, so Biggs was seconded from his military duties and he was sent out uh, on tour to make photographs, some of which you will see in the exhibition, um, and these were made on the calotype negative process which produces a paper negative uh, the same size as the print. Um, this is an example of one of his first images made at Bijapur in early 1855. Uh, he took a total of nearly 30 or 40 images at Bijapur. Again, a well-known um, site at Bijapur, of course, the famous Ibrahim Rosa. Um, this is the mosque of the um, next to the tomb. Um, there's an interesting question in relation to Bijapur. This is a slight... Um, divergence. Um, just before photography came to Bijapur, um, artists had been sent to the town, um, sorry I've gone backwards, um, and produced um, under the patron, patronage of Sir Bartle Freer, a beautiful series of architectural drawings of Bijapur. And Bijapur with photographers coming there, it became a target for photographers right through the 19th century. And it's slightly difficult to account for its popularity. Of course, there are many famous monuments there. But I suspect it's the fact this early interest in Bijapur was a result of the fact that Satara, the princely state, had been annexed by the British in 1849. And this period was the first time they had real access to the monuments of Bijapur. So it's extensively photographed um, throughout the 19th century. Um, Biggs then went on to other sites in the Deccan. Um, Aoli was one of his major stopping off points. Of course, I, most you'll all be aware of the vast number of temples at Aoli, early Chalukyan architecture. Um, and of course, the most famous temple of all, the Durga temple. Um, it's worth um, stopping at this image because if we examine it in a little more detail, it reveals some really quite interesting points. In front, you can see two sculptural panels resting against the wall of the temple. These, I believe, are now in the Indian Museum. But 
Um, they stand there and one assumes Biggs found them, but um, they also remain there for the next 20 years. This is the negative of that print and you'll see the two images there. Um, James Burgess, who I just mentioned, came back 20 years later and photographed these um, sculptures in the same position. They just remain there with the addition of another one. But what is interesting is if one examines Biggs's other negatives, you can see that he actually took one of those pieces from inside uh, the temple itself. So there's um, an undescribed movement of material which for a modern archaeologist would be quite unacceptable, but um, the dictates of um, picturely attractiveness, I think, uh, probably um, overtook those sorts of scruples. Um, Biggs was rather abruptly told to return to his military duties before he had completed his work, and his place was taken by a man called um, William Harry Pigu, who photographed at Hampi, Chitradurga, and a number of sites, um, until he too, um, also at Halibid, took up some beautiful photographs of the temple there, um, until he died very early, and with the coming of the First War of Indian Independence, these photographs were largely forgotten until the middle years of the next decade, when they were um, published in two large folio volumes. So this was the first photographic initiative in India, um, and it took place in the Bombay presidency, um, but lapsed after that time. And the next sort of resurgence of photography with government attempts to use photography as a documentary tool come with an expedition that was sent out from um, Bombay to uh, the temple at Ambanat. And this was the government's attempt to um, produce a more organized recording of Indian monuments rather than uh, a sort of scattergun approach of photographing everything that came to light. They said, well, let's concentrate on one site each year and we will send out teams from the various um, schools of art. Um, Calcutta's team was sent to Orissa. Uh, the Bombay team from the JJ School of Art was sent to Ambanat with the purpose of taking photographs, making plaster casts of sculptural details, making detailed architectural drawings of the site. Um, so the photographs that we have were taken by an Indian photographer, which is quite rare in, in these early days of archaeological documentation, a man named Shishanka Nairan, uh, who was curator at the School of Art and later became um, a significant photographer in Bombay in his own right. Um, this was a series of 35 photographs of that expedition. Interesting to see the temple at the right in quite open country at that time. Um, and so a series of um, studies of the structure itself. Um, a rare view, actually, of laborers employed on site to um, work under the expedition, which is very uncommon at this stage for anyone to actually photograph the people employed in working for um, surveyors. Um, and I follow this um, with just a continuation of Narayan's career because he became photographer at the JJ School of Art. And in the 1870s and 80s, the school started to send teams to Ajanta, taking teams of students to make painted copies of the wall paintings um, in Ajanta. And then Narayan actually photographed the, photographed the painted copies of the wall paintings. So it's a sort of third generation um, copying of this material uh, and a very interesting quote from Griffith who organized um, those um, outings to Ajanta which went on for many years. Um, some of the paintings were sent back to England which and many of them were destroyed in a fire. Um, I believe there are some in the CSMVS collection are there not and presumably also in the JJ School of Art collection. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure how they're distributed nowadays. Um, the, this sort of segue to Ajanta is merely an excuse to introduce the next photographer in the exhibition, who is a man named Robert Gill. Now, Gill had been at Ajanta before 
um, photography was generally in use um, in India. He was sent by the Madras government in 1844 to make painted copies of the wall paintings. This is just when Ajanta was starting to receive a good deal of European documentation um, interest by scholars. Um, Gill went to Ajanta uh, in 1844. He lived locally um, and um, camped out in the caves, making his copies. Um, these were sent back to England. He made his final painted copies of cave paintings in about 1863. Um, and fire again struck. Most of his paintings were destroyed in the Crystal Palace fire in London in 1866. There are very few survivors of those paintings. Uh, this is one of them that's now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. They've been the subject of a major conservation um, project in recent years. but. By the time he'd given up making paintings, Gill had actually taken up photography and he produced a long series of photographs for the Indian government, but also on his own account for publishing in books in London. Um, Gill was also keen on the, um, he took a number of standard views, which give a very evocative account of what a Janta looked like before it became a fairly manicured World Heritage Site. This was the sort of condition of the caves when in the in the 1860s. Um, as well as these standard views, um, Gill also took a number of these um, stereoscopic views, which um, in addition to their architectural interest are fascinating because they show you um, his domestic circumstances as he camped out in the caves for long periods. You can see his clothes he's a rather messy character by all accounts um and this one you can see his um his table set out with his tea things and on the left is photographic equipment if we do a quick detail of that image you can see on the left his his tea and a bottle of something or other uh, on the on sorry on the right and on the left uh, his developing trays and dishes and Photography is almost sort of referenced in his photographs um, to such an extent that in one extreme case you see a camera placed centre stage in one of his views of the of the verandas of the cave. This is one of the this is the stereoscopic camera, a double lens camera to produce double images to make a um, three dimensional seeming um, photograph. Gill left Ajanta, well, actually, he took some more photographs for government in, in Berar, but his, his work at Ajanta largely came to an end in about 1870s. And by this time, the Indian government was starting to ask questions about who were the best people to make these documentary records. They could rely on amateurs. They could um, send military personnel on secondment like, like Gill. Um, or alternatively, they could commission professional photographers. Now, Edmund David Lyon was the first of these professional photographers um, commissioned by, first of all, by the Madras government and then by the Bombay government to photograph architectural sites. He's a very fine photographer. This is, um, uh, as you all know, a sighted uh, view at, of the Tala Temple at, at Hampi. Um, and... I include uh, this photograph because it's one of the few photographs of non-architectural interest that, that Lyon took during his, his tours. Um, and finally from Lyon, um, sorry, um, just an indication of how interesting these negatives are and what they tell us about the photographer's working practices. Because the... Um, film used in um, the chemistry used in 19th century photography was orthochromatic. In other words, it was sensitive to blue light largely. It meant skies tended to be overexposed and blank. So photographers commonly drew in clouds onto their negatives. And Lyon did this extensively in his photographs. And you'll see several ex examples in the exhibition of his um, use of hand-drawn clouds in the skies of his negatives. Um, but the use of professional photographers um, who were given free range to go off and photograph what they want uh, inevitably raised problems. And this was something that Ferguson highlighted when he said that um, 
well, lion's photographs are very good photographs, but they're all of subjects I've already got photographs of. Um, he re-photographed a, a lot of the most celebrated sites uh, because his interest was in building up stock for sale when he went back to Europe, uh, which was not really what the, the scholar needed. Um, so Lyon was clearly not given direct instructions about where he should photograph. He was given largely free reign to um, travel over southern and western India. Um, that led, in Bombay at least, to another example of the professional photographer being used under the direction of an archaeologist. Now Burgess said this very clearly. He, he, he specifically said, I don't want photographs as pretty pictures. I want photographs that are of use to the scholar. And the only way to obtain them is for the photographer to work directly under um, the archaeologist who will tell him what he needs to photograph. And he was very successful in persuading the Bombay government to allow him to commission the Bombay firm of Sykes and Dwyer uh, and he would accompany them to sites and he would tell them what to photograph. So he successfully traveled with, with Sykes um, to, to the Nasik area. He photographed in the town and he also photographed the nearby Buddhist cave um, monuments um, and also making inscriptions and re-photographing those inscriptions. Um, archaeologists among you will know this technique. Um, of making what are called squeezes or estampage. Um, again, it comes back to this question of photo photography not being terribly useful for photographing inscriptions in dark interiors. Uh, what happens here, of course, is you get a thick uh, paper which is dampened and then pressed into the um, inscriptions inside the caves. It's then allowed to dry and peeled off uh, leaving a relief inscription of the ins a relief inscription of the inscription, which is actually here now being rephotographed. Um, Sykes and Dwyer, and I, I believe Sykes was probably the principal photographer, um, accompanied Burgess on a number of tours up into Gujarat in 1869. Um, he also photographed the Elephanta Caves for Burgess, and these were produced in a published work with original photographs pasted into the, um, into the volume. The um, reviewer in the Times of India complimented Sykes on producing a complex system of reflectors which brought light in from the outside to the back of the caves at, at um, Elephanta, and particularly the, a lot of the larger sculptures at Elephanta are in, are in quite dark, um, quite dark parts of the caves. Um, this is Burgess here. Burgess was actually um, quite a skilled photographer in his own right and had one the space it would have been very nice to include a section on Burgess's photography but here you see him at, at Gop in Gujarat uh, and if you look at the detail you can see him timing the exposure with his pocket watch and he appears in this way in a number of his own photographs. Um, but the last figure featuring in the exhibition, who has, I'm glad to say, a um, prominent position in it, is a figure who I thought that I had a rather lonely enthusiasm for Henry Cousins in England. Um, I discover coming here that it's an enthusiasm that is shared by a number of curators at CSMVS and of course Cousins had a direct association with the museum and of course there are there is material from his excavations on display in the museum. Uh, he was a remarkable man and he was Burgess's protege, I think. I think it's fair to say that. He took him on in around 1875 um, and Burgess's father was a photozincographer, that is a reproduction photographer. So he clearly was taught some photographic techniques early on. He joined Burgess in, in 1875 and what some of the first photographs that seem to survive from that association are taken in the early 1880s when, uh, I'll come back to that, um, and indeed that, um, when Burgess sent Cousins down to 
Amaravati to photograph some of these stupa fragments that had just come to light. And when he sent him down, he said, Cousins will do far better than any professional photographer. He knows how to photograph for archaeological purposes. And I'm sending him down rather than employ someone locally to do this work. And he produced a very rather beautiful set of uh, photographs of the fragments, which have a rather modernist look with this blacked out background. Um, but again, examining the negatives is, is quite revealing. So we see that, in fact, um, this, the border of this photograph has been blacked out. But behind, you can see the office background in which this piece has been photographed. Uh, it's obviously been propped against a chair or something to photograph. And then the background of the negative has been blacked out. Um, let me just briefly go back to these pictures. This is Cousins on the right photographing in the later stages of his career in um, in um, uh, in India. And this is um, one of the ways in which Burgess wished to use these photographs. In the last years of the century, he produced a large portfolio of views of uh, Indian architecture taken by these photographers and others from across India, there seems to be not very much communication between government departments because if you can read that preface clearly, you will see that he said halfway through putting this um, portfolio together, we realize there's a whole collection of similar stuff sitting in the Indian Museum in Calcutta. So it's going to be a bit delayed until we can get access to that. Um, but it, it did appear, and so photography, from Burgess's point of view, was a way of distributing knowledge to a European audience, both scholarly and popular, to disseminate knowledge about Indian architecture and to promote it for um, an, a European audience. Um, I, I sort of probably put that slide in, in a rather inappropriate place. But let's return to Cousins. Um, in the course of his career, he... This, this is the point at which photography really does seem to become amalgamated in the day-to-day -day work of the surveyor. Because Cousins was a skilled photographer, but he, he did, of course, have Indian assistance, and we don't know how much of the work that was done, which is credited to Cousins, can actually maybe attributed to Indian workers, uh, who generally were not um, credited with the work. But he toured all over uh, very, very extensively and, and also, of course, wrote very extensively about Indian architecture. And these photographs form the basis of the illustrations in his own works and also in Burgess's works. Um, both Burgess and Cousins were also skilled draftsmen. So photography and draftsmanship was used as the principal tool for illustrating their their work and I'm just going to show a few examples this of course is the what is now the immaculate world heritage site of Champanier this is what it was like in the 1880s and Cousins and Burgess describe what was once the you know the political capital of Gujarat in the 16th century as being entirely deserted largely apart from and and its monuments in disarray and crumbling um, that and and in fact, if one compares this with modern photographs, of which there is one in the exhibition, one can see the um, how they've been brought back into a remarkable beauty now. And um, I, I, I'm very fond of this photograph. It's not in the exhibition, but it shows some of the wonderful wooden architecture of Gujarat, which survives from here here and there but i suspect that this particular building has has long gone um it's not precisely identified but cousins took a number of photographs of of, of this type of architecture in 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 gujarat and i like the charpoy stacked next to the door um, i include this because this is um just a sort of technical pointer um Photography in the 19th century was a difficult procedure. With the wet collodion process, you had to uh, sensitize and expose and develop your image in the field before the chemistry dried. But by the 1880s, a process called the gelatine dry process, uh, dry plate process, had <coughs> come into use. And this meant that you could take ready prepared 
plates into the field um, and so and you could you didn't have to process them on the spot so the whole process of photography towards the end of the century is becoming much more straightforward um, I put this little um, enlargement there because what it also did was it allowed much quicker or shorter exposures and you can see from the fact that his actually captured moving figures in this image that it's an exposure of a fraction of a second rather than the multiples of seconds that were generally acquired by the wet collodion process um, and i'd like to mention because it's it's an illustration of cousins's photographic precision and skill is that in 1900 he was sent by the government to make a detailed photographic survey of the buddhist stupa at sanchi and in order to take photographs at a constant distance and a constant scale and without distortion of each freeze on the gateways of the stupa he built this um ladder-like construction so that his camera could be raised and lowered to the required height and he had a rubber tube going down to the ground which he described as i use an ordinary enema tube to make the exposure um, and in the course of about two months he took nearly 250 photographs at sanchi um, and it's a reflection of their quality that when Marshall and Fouché came to publish their great work on the stupa of Sanchi in 1940, I think, um, it was Cousins' photographs that were used to illustrate it. Um, they remain um, still one of the best photographic records in detail of, of the stupa at Sanchi. And I just closing with one or two photographs and I don't want to detain you any longer because you should go and see the exhibition but just to give some indication of how useful on how illustrative these photographs are now sometimes in rural areas little has changed this charming little temple in in Denuj in in Gujarat which sits by the tank in the little village is hardly changed to the present day um, there's no cow dung in the tray in the foreground, but apart from that, the temple is, is precisely similar. Um, this illustrates another aspect. Um, this this um, tomb, which when Cousins photographed it, was enclosed or surrounded by an extensive garden, um, is now entirely swallowed up by the urban fabric of Ahmedabad. Um, you can only see these little the top of the tomb from um, surrounding rooftops. Uh, it's, it's a vivid illustration of the dangers and the requirements of conservation in, in India. And of course, in rapidly expanding urban environments, it happens frequently. And, and, but it's clearly something that photographs like this could perhaps forewarn us about. Um, and I close with this, which again is another sad tale. This um, Cousins visited Chandravati in 1889, and he said the only remains of uh, this once wonderful site is this column, which by its loneliness emphasizes destruction all around. And he says that destruction was not far to discover. In the local riverbed were the remains of temple stones and sculptures broken up by railway engineers to form bedding for embankments um, that was a not uncommon um, complaint from governments the um, willful philistinism of some government offices um, cousins retired in 1910 and he gives a very bald statement in his annual review saying, this is my last year of operation and I'm retiring to England. But he allows himself one slightly elegiac note. He refers to James Burgess, his former boss, and himself. And he says, I am the last of that party. This is that party of those great 19th century archaeologists and photographers who have made such a marvelous record of India and Western India in this case, which is on display in the exhibition. And I think you've heard quite enough from me and I hope you will go and see the exhibition now. Thank you.
thank you john that was a really wonderful talk and for also giving us a chance to look at more of what's in the british library collection as you all know we've only got 80 of them here so we've had a chance to look at a lot more of what complements this exhibition so thank you john and for those of you who are interested in know, learning more about the work of these photographers john's doing a walk through of the exhibition on saturday 26 november at 11 am so do join us again and now without any further ado i'd like to invite you all to view the exhibition on the first floor and we'll begin there by the ceremonial lighting of the lamp and then you can all have a look at this little masterpiece thank you